All right, um, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, tonight, we're going to, of course, continue our sutra study. Uh, we are going to remain in the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. We're going to move on to the next sutra from last week. So this is going to be sutta number 38 uh, on page 349 of the Wisdom uh, Publication Edition, if you have it. This is tonight's sutta is going to be the Mahatanha Samkhya Sutta. So the longer discourse on the destruction of Tanha. So last week we read the Chula Tanha Samkhya Sutta. The little discourse on the destruction of craving. And today or this evening, we're going to read or we're going to start. This is probably going to be a multiple part one because it's a long sutta. Uh, but we're going to start the long version tonight. And I actually I shouldn't call it the long version because they're not the same sutra at all. They just happen to both be suttas about the the. Sankhyaha, the, the destruction of Tanha. And really quickly, yeah, but really quickly before we kind of even get into tonight's sutta, a couple of points from last week. So last week we talked a lot about Tanha, craving, or yeah, craving, the thirstiness, right? And that's what the sutta is about the destruction of tanha, craving. And last week, I spent a little bit of time just kind of talking about these different terms in the world of Buddhism, in particular, the difference between the word tanha, craving, and chahanda, desire. And we also sort of threw in there the idea of upadana, uh, clinging, or appropriating attachment. So those are kind of three different ideas in the world of Buddhism. And the most important thing I think, or not the most important, but an important thing that was mentioned last weekend, it was that tanha, the, the idea of the, the craving, tanha is always bad. <laughs> always negative, always detrimental to our well-being. <laughs> chahanda, on the other hand, desire, chahanda is not necessarily good or bad. So chahanda as desire, or it's actually just the will, the will to do something. And the point is, is that if one's desire is to, say, get drunk all the time, that's not going to be a really uh, beneficial desire. But if you desire to stop drinking, <laughs> you've noticed you have a problem and your chanda is to stop doing that. You need that. You need the desire to not do it. Otherwise, you wouldn't stop. So ch Chahanda can kind of go either way. But Tanha, again, Tanha is, a, it's the craving. But tonight, I just wanted to introduce one way of thinking about it. And it's a, kind of the difference between well, the difference between a, a regular, normal desire for something versus an addiction. And what I mean is, is that, you know, the nature of addiction is tricky, but a part of it is this sense that, like, I need to have that drink. Not like, oh, sure, I'd love a glass of wine. <laughs> no, no, no. We're talking about the 
I need it. And, and I, in a way I can't function without it. I can't be social without it. Like I need it. That's the craving that we're working with or talking about. And it's that kind of deeper, absolute, like, basically it's the absolute sense that I can't be happy without that. Whereas if it's sort of like, well, I'd like to do that. Oh, no, no, sorry. You can't do that. Okay. I'll do this then. <laughs> And, and and then that's a more flexible kind of desire for something versus a craving. And so the sutta that we talked about last weekend, the sutta we're going to talk about tonight is about destroying tanha. So I just want to stay focused on that. Now, tonight, though, we're actually going to have a really fun conversation. And I think it'll be a fun conversation because... At the very end of last weekend's Dharma Doors, we came to the inevitable, the inevitable question that always comes up. And it's this question about if this idea of no self is true, who stops craving? <laughs> who walks the path to enlightenment like the it's the idea of like okay if there's no self then who or what is the agent here and we sort of started talking about that at the end of last week but wouldn't you know it that's exactly where tonight's sutta is going to pick up so allow me to kind of introduce the sutta i'm going to read just the first part of it to introduce like the topic um yeah, so let me just do that. So again, this is Sutta 38 in the Majjhima Nikaya, and we're reading the Bhikkhu Bodhi translation. Feel free to kick back and listen or read along if you have it. So here's this the beginning of the Maha Tanha Samkhya Sutta. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Buddha, the Blessed One, was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's park. Now, on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in a bhikkhu named Sati, son of a fisherman. And the view, the pernicious view that arose in Sati was this. As I understand the Dharma taught by the Blessed One, it's the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round of rebirths, not another one. Several other monks, several bhikkhus, having heard about this, went to the bhikkhu sati and asked him, Friend, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? Exactly so, friends. As I understand the Dharma taught by the Blessed One, it's this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another one. Then those bhikkhus desiring to detach him from that pernicious view pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him, saying, Friend Sati, don't do that. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It's not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus. For in many ways, the Blessed One has stated that consciousness is dependently originated or dependently arisen, since without a condition, there is no origination of consciousness. Yet, although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by those bhikkhus in this way, the bhikkhu sati, son of a fisherman, still obstinately adhered to that pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. Since the bhikkhus were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One 
And after paying homage to him, they sat down to one side and told him all that had occurred, adding, Venerable sir, since we could not detach the Bhikkhu Sati, son of a fisherman, from this pernicious view, we have reported the matter to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain Bhikkhu thus, Come, Bhikkhu, tell the Bhikkhu Sati, son of a fisherman, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhu replied, and he went to the bhikkhu sati and told him the teacher one calls you, friend sati. Yes, friend, he replied, and went to see the blessed one, and after paying homage to him, sat down to one side. The blessed one then asked, sati, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? As I understand the Dharma taught by the Blessed One, it's this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another one. Exactly so, Venerable Sir. As I understand the Dharma taught by the Blessed One, it's this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another one. What is that consciousness, Sati? Venerable Sir, it is that which speaks. It's that which feels and experiences here and there the results of good and bad actions. The Buddha said, Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dharma in that way? Misguided man. Have I not stated in many ways that consciousness is dependently arisen, since without a condition, there's no origination of consciousness? But you, misguided man, have misrepresented us by your wrong grasp and injured yourself and stored up much demerit, for this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the bhikkhus, uh, then the blessed one addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, what do you all think? Has the bhikkhu sati, son of a fisherman, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this dharma and discipline? How could he, venerable sir? No, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. And when this was said, the bhikkhu sati, son of a fisherman, sat silent, dismayed with shoulders drooping and head down, glum and with no response. Then, knowing this, the Blessed One told him, Misguided man, you will be recognized by your pernicious view. I shall question the other bhikkhus in this matter. And then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, do you understand the Dharma taught by me? as this bhikkhu sati son of a fisherman does, when he misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit? No, venerable sir, for, for in many discourses, the Blessed One has stated, consciousness is dependently arisen, since without a condition, there's no origination of consciousness. Good bhikkhus, it's good that you understand the Dharma taught by me thus. For in many ways I have stated, consciousness is dependently arisen, since without a condition, there's no origination of consciousness. But this bhikkhu sati, son of a fisherman, rip, misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit. For this will lead to the harm and suffering of this misguided man for a long time. All right. Let's pause there and talk about Sati's pernicious view. So, and this is this is a super, super important kind of teaching tonight about the nature of consciousness in Buddhism. And I'm going to try to stick to like a really straightforward thing here because this can get complicated. First thing I want to mention is, is this, like, let's clarify what is Sati's pernicious view? Well, Sati's saying that as he understands the Dharma, it's this consciousness 
that then wanders through kind of what we would call reincarnation, the birth, death, and rebirth process. But he's claiming that it's this consciousness that is going to sort of go and be reborn in a, in a new life someday. Now, something that I want to make really clear, and I do this often, I know that many of us do not kind of come from a, uh, we don't come from a worldview necessarily of reincarnation. It's not sort of like a default Western teaching that parents instill in their children normally in the Western world, right? Of course, in India, and of course, at the time of the Buddha, the default mode understanding of what's going on here is that there is a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. And that's just sort of like a given. It's just at a certain point, kind of like in Indian thinking, it's like, what else could be going on? What what else could happen besides just birth, re death, rebirth, birth, death, rebirth, birth, death, rebirth? But because many of us might not come from or ha again have been raised with that worldview of reincarnation, it might be that we don't even think that way. Well, I often like to make it clear that if if you don't think that way about reincarnation, it doesn't matter. Because what they're talking about, what Buddhism is talking about, and what sati, for example, this pernicious view of sati, a way to understand it, the exact same teaching or the miss, the exact same pernicious view, it's the view or the idea that it was this consciousness that used to be a baby. And it was this consciousness that went to elementary school. And it was this consciousness that went to high school and this consciousness that went to college and this consciousness that became a teacher that who is now before you, hi. And it will be this consciousness that you will meet next week when if you come to Dharma Doors. In other words, me. Ah, but that's where sati, see, sati could be a good Buddhist by not believing in the socially constructed self, by which I mean a name. You, you know you are not your name, right? <laughs> you do realize you could change your name, right? So your name is actually not inherent. You know, you could change a lot of things about you, like your marital status, your job, your occupation, all kinds of things about you. So a good Buddhist, even sati here, could be a good Buddhist if sati sort of wasn't clinging to that socially constructed notion of a me. But sati has this pernicious view that the consciousness that experiences pleasure and pain, that consciousness is the consciousness that was a baby that is here with you now and that will be here next week. So the pernicious view is that there's a consciousness undergoing samsara or just that there's a consciousness that's having a life, that's living a life day after day after day. Now, I know that that is sort of, that's the default mode understanding of, of humans, is this idea of me living my life. And more importantly, it's the idea of things or experiences happening to me, like happening to me, not necessarily experiences being had, 
but experience is happening to me. And there's a very subtle difference between those two ways of understanding experience. An experience is happening to you or an experience that's sort of happening. So Sati, even though he may have overcome an attachment to ego, he holds this pernicious view that it is this consciousness, meaning this one that's talking, this consciousness is the one that trans migrates. And it's this idea that it's this consciousness that is, i um, looking for the language again. Well, it's that idea of receiving the pleasure and receiving the non-pleasure. So the Buddha steps up and, or all the monks, all the other bhikkhus step up and they say, that's the wrong teaching. That's not what the Buddha teaches. And Sati's kind of like, as far as I'm concerned, it is. <laughs> and that's when they say, well, let's go see the Buddha about this. And of course, that's when the Buddha clears this up and says, I've never said that. I've never said that consciousness is what transmigrates. I've never said that it's consciousness that receives pleasure and pain in that way. In fact, the Buddha always teaches, he says, that consciousness is dependently arisen and that without a condition, there's no origination of consciousness. By the way, before we kind of go any further with this, I want a, a quick language thing. So last week and at the beginning of tonight, I talked about these different words for like craving versus desire versus clinging. Well, tonight we're going to kind of be exploring these different words, these different ideas that can be translated as like consciousness versus mind. And there's a few other words that might come up, but I won't bring them up in, until we get there. But I want to make it clear that what Sati is talking about, what the Buddha is talking about, is this idea of vijnana. So vijnana or vijnana in Sanskrit is this kind of particular function of sensory organs. And actually, before I even say any more, unless there's any, because I know I, I, this has all been kind of introductory in that way. So unless anybody's like totally lost or has a burning question, let's get to the next section where the Buddha goes deeper into this idea of the, the dependent arising of consciousness. So, the Buddha continues, now he's about to give his teaching, which is the, the correct view in that way, not the pernicious view of sati. So he says, bhikkhus, vijnana, consciousness, is reckoned, consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent upon the I and visible forms, it's reckoned as I consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent upon the ear and sounds, it's, it's called or it's reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent upon the nose and odors, it is reckoned as nose consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent upon the tongue and flavors, it's reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent upon the body and tangible objects, it is reckoned as bodily consciousness. And when consciousness arises dependent upon the mental faculty, the brain, and mental objects called dharmas, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. 
just like a fire. Just like a fire is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it burns. When fire de burns, burns dependent upon logs, it's reckoned as a log fire. When fire burns dependent upon twigs, it's reckoned as a twig fire. When fire burns dependent upon grass, it's reckoned as a grass fire. When fire burns dependent upon cow dung, it's reckoned as a cow dung fire. When fire burns dependent upon chaff, it's reckoned as a chaff fire. When fire burns dependent upon a dumpster, it's reckoned as a dumpster fire. So too, consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent upon I and visible forms, it's called I consciousness, and so on with the other sense organs down to when consciousness arises dependent upon the mind and mental objects, it's reckoned as mind consciousness. Okay. So I see a few new names, few new faces. So I'm going to uh, kind of, I want to explain this sort of in, in detail, kind of as I understand it, as I sort of like to teach it. So this is, if you haven't actually ever heard about it, this is going to be your crash course in the idea of dependent origination, this idea of pratitya sam udpatta. So this is a really kind of like just a condensed, straightforward description of dependent arising. And this is what we, this is how we want to understand it, or this is a good way to understand it, I think. The Buddha here is talking about the conditions that are necessary for there to be the arising of consciousness. And as we just noticed, there's eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose, tongue, body consciousness, and a kind of mental consciousness. So the first thing that we need to kind of make clear is that in Western terminology, like Western psychology, consciousness is singular. Consciousness is synonymous with awareness, thinking, thought, being, you know, being awake. So there's a way in which translating vijnana as consciousness is not quite right. Or I would suggest, and I often do, at this point, I suggest thinking of vijnana more as kind of an awareness. And what I mean by that is, I, it makes more sense to me to talk about visual awareness versus visual consciousness. Because I don't know about you, but when I was a student and I first heard about I consciousness in Buddhism, I had a cartoonish image of the eyeballs like thinking. And it took me a while actually to abandon that kind of cartoonish way of thinking about it. And now I understand like, oh, it's about a kind of visual awareness or an auditory awareness or an olfactory or gustatory or tactile or mental awareness. And so just in the same way that you might hear a, um, a, a sound, like maybe a, a siren, <laughs> contact with the ear gives rise to a kind of auditory awareness that there's a noise. Oh, oh, a noise. Now that noise would then be interpreted by the mental faculty to be an ambulance or, or something. But the initial kind of awareness that there's a sound was done by the ear and there's a ear awareness that arises. But if all of a sudden I kind of had a nostalgic memory from childhood, well, that would be the mental faculty. And that would be the mental faculty coming into contact with a dharma, 
a mental object, which is basically something like a memory, for example. A memory is a dharma, a mental object. And that's different than a car alarm. And it's different than a visual form. And it's different than a taste or a smell. It's like a memory, for example. So those are the six awarenesses. Again, they're called vijnana or consciousnesses. But I just kind of want us to, uh, initially, we need to understand that the Buddha is talking about six different awarenesses working in tandem or working in conjunction. All right. So that's an important part about this, that it's six different awarenesses that are kind of co-functioning. But now let's get to what the Buddha is really talking about. It's this idea that he says, well, it's this idea of consciousness arising dependent upon the eyes and visible forms or ears and sounds. Now, if, if you've seen this before, I apologize, but just bear with me. But in order to illustrate this kind of phenomena of the arising of consciousness or the arising of awareness, I like to use the example of a vinyl record and a record needle. Now, I know this is not a record needle, but this is my prop, because if I had a real record needle, you wouldn't be able to see it. So a record needle and a record. Now, I, whenever I do this, whenever I use this as an example, I really hope that you have played a vinyl record before and so that you know kind of how they work, because this could be lost on you if you, do, if you, if you don't know how they work. But if you're like me, as a child, my parents taught me how to take an actual sewing needle, like a real metal sewing needle, and how if you put it in the groove, so you have to put the needle in contact with the record, and then if you were to then, you know, move the record, sound comes out of the needle. And you can hear the music of the record humming out of the needle. <laughs> so a record and the record needle and the music that arises when they come into contact, this is a good analogy for what the Buddha is talking about in terms of a sensory organ. So this could be your eyeballs. This could be your ear, this could be your nose, your tongue, your body, or your brain. And this could be a visual object, or a sound, or a smell, or a flavor, or a tactile object, or a memory, right? Or an idea. Now, what the Buddha is talking about is that there's eyeballs, and there's visible forms. And when the two come into contact, and this is a technical term in Buddhism called sparsha, but when there is sparsha, when there's contact, there arises visual awareness. When there's eyeballs, visual objects, and contact, there's visual awareness. This is, by the way, exactly like this and what i mean is is this watch it's really simple if you can see the record right now you're in visual contact with it and the reason why you're having visual awareness of it is because you're in con your eyes are in contact with it but watch can you see it can you see the record anymore why don't you have visual awareness of my record right now? Oh, because I severed contact. Ah, oh, I reestablished contact, and now you can see it. 
as I often like to point out, this is no different than if I'm talking. Now you can hear me. Contact, auditory awareness. No contact. There's just no awareness. Now, there's something very important. To, there's many things that are important about this an analogy or about this teaching. Here's the first super important one. So you know that, or I hope you know again, that this record, like a vinyl record, if you get in you know, really closely, there are these grooves, right? There's these grooves in the vinyl and that groove is the record's form. This is what the Buddhists call rupa, shape or form. But I want you to understand that the shape and the form of this, it's not just about it being round. That, that's an important part of it being a, a vinyl record, is it being round. But the rupa, the shape of this, it's all the way down to the little grooves that make it this record and not an Elvis Presley record or some other record that has a different form. So this is material rupa, material matter or material form in a particular shape, okay? A record needle is also rupa. It is also physical matter in a particular shape. And if you've had many record players and you've if you've gone through record needles, you know that all record needles are not made all the same. So the shape of some record needles is super sharp and you get a really crisp sound. Other record needles are really cheap and they're very dull and you get a lot of a lot of the static sound. All right. So what I'm getting at is, is that the object is a particular form and this is a particular form. And when these get together, there arises music. This is, we already said this, but what I want us to notice is, is this, let's say that this is, you know, I, you know, whatever, uh, a song and you put the needle in contact and the music arises and it sounds a particular way. Let's just say, notice that if I change the shape or the form of this record, like if I go in and kind of mess with some of those grooves. So if I change the shape of this, notice that when I put the needle back in contact, the music is different. It, it changes, of course, because I've changed the record, right? But if I change this, the needle, when I come put the two into contact, the music is different. And this points to the fact that the music, meaning the, the emergent phenomena of the music, it's not entirely just the record and it's not entirely just the needle. It is dependently arisen from both of them. And if you change either of these, you change the outcome. Okay, check this out. The world is a bunch of objects of form or shape in that way. And my eyeballs are shaped a certain way. When I go out, into the world and I look at a tree, because I'm nearsighted, 
I think it's nearsighted, whichever, I always get those confused, but whichever one it is, when I go out and I look at trees, I really actually can't see the leaves because it's just blurry. So the visual awareness that is arising for me is a little blurry, right? But you know what I could do? I could go get Lasix. I could get a surgery where they literally change the form or the shape of my eyeball. And then I would go outside and my visual awareness, I would be able to see every single little leaf. But it's not that the world changed, my eyeballs changed. But I could also have the same exact eyeballs. And if I go out and my next door neighbor has removed the tree, I could get as much Lasix as they have and I would not be able to see the tree because it has changed. What I'm getting at is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, especially for tonight's sutra, we need to understand that what you're seeing at this moment is not just what's out there and it's not just what's kind of in your mind in that way. It is dependently arising in that way. And if you change anything about either of these, meaning the sensory organ or the sensory object, the emergent phenomena will change. Okay, fine. I have visual, there's, oh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm gonna try to be careful with my language now. There is visual awareness arising now because there is contact between eyeballs and visual forms. There is auditory awareness arising because there are ears in contact with sounds. There's olfactory awareness arising because there's a nose coming into contact with smells. Yep, there's gustatory awareness because there's a mouth tongue coming into contact with flavors. There's a bodily awareness arising because there's a body that's in contact with the seat, the air that's a particular temperature. And so the bodily awareness that's arising right now is the awareness of the temperature in the room as it is now, the firmness of my seat as it is now. And then there's that interesting sixth sensory organ the brain mind. And this is the one I was talking about earlier where you might see something, you might hear something, or you might think of something. Now, if you haven't heard this be uh, before from me, I want to make this clear as well. In the Western psychological tradition, the brain is the generator of ideas. That is the, the view, the Western psychological view of the brain is that ideas are kind of popping out of it. In the world of Buddhism, it's a very different understanding of consciousness and conscious awareness. It's not that the ideas are coming out of your brain mind. What it is, is that you can basically think of it as like, remember a little bit ago, I was talking about like a, a nostalgic childhood memory. What it is, is that a nostalgic childhood memory comes into contact with your brain mind. And what it is to think of something is actually to be in contact with that idea. And then there is the arising and the emergence of a kind of conscious awareness of that idea. And it's just like the music or, or the sounds, which is when, when the ambulance finally goes far away and I can't hear the ambulance anymore or the siren, there's just no more auditory awareness of the siren. Well, when that nostalgic childhood memory has faded, 
what that means is, is that the brain mind is just no longer in contact with that nostalgic memory. And what you are consciously aware of right now is whatever your brain mind is in contact with. All of this, by the way, is trying to get us to understand how it is that there is a present state of conscious awareness that is ever always shifting with every sensory input. Every shift of every sensory input is shifting the emergent conscious awareness at any given moment. But somebody like Sati thinks that that conscious awareness is the same conscious awareness that was the one that they had as a child. And that's what just from a Buddhist's point of view just doesn't make any sense. How could this present state of conscious awareness that has arisen based on this, how could this possibly be what was a baby? That was that conscious awareness, which was that body, which was a tiny baby body, in contact with all kinds of other things, with a brain mind that had an awareness that was totally different than this present state of awareness. But this is what the Buddha is sort of talking to Sati about, or talking to the bhikkhus about. There is this present arisen state of consciousness that is happening. But there's no person to whom it's happening. That's the big mistake. That's the big error is thinking that this is happening to somebody versus this being the emergence of all the contact. Now, the thing about it is, is that if you understand this, meaning if you understand the dependent origination of consciousness and you understand, oh, anything that I'm aware of is part this, part that. And so I have two options for changing awareness. <laughs> what I mean is, is I can, in order to change a conscious state of awareness, I can change the external, but there's also changing the quote internal. But if you kind of are under the assumption that it is only the external objects that you are perceiving, in other words, if you view the eyes and the ears and the nose and the tongue, if you view these sensory organs as like windows, and a lot of people do. Again, this is kind of a default mode way of thinking of the sensory organs, which is that they're just windows that, through which the mind is looking at the world. But it's just the world that's out there, and the mind is looking through the windows of the eyes and the ears. And your window, your mind is looking through the eyes and ears of your windows. So my point is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, that's not the right way to think about conscious awareness. You are, um, uh, well, you're culpable in the production of this awareness. And by culpable, I'm joking. What I mean is, is you are a, a participant in what is arising now because of everything we just talked about in the sense of that it is both the sensory organs and the sensory objects that are combining or coming into contact. And there is an emergent phenomena called awareness or vijnana, consciousness. Okay, questions, comments, answers, ideas. That was all a lot of information. Everybody doing okay with all that? Yeah, Maria. Yeah, Maria. 
Well, I think I'll start with the, the quick first question that comes up for me, which is then why is there so much discussion in Buddhism about rebirth and reincarnation and karmic streams and purifying the karmic stream and all of that that i'm i feel like um you know the the i feel like ananda in the Surangama sutra i just don't understand so mm -hmm. maybe uh compassion you can enlighten us <laughs> <laughs> so indeed this is a, it's a really important question so if everything i just said and everything I said is just kind of paraphrasing what the Buddha said. So if everything that the Buddha just said about consciousness and all of that is sort of true, then yeah, Maria's question is totally valid. Then why all this talk about rebirth? And it's a tricky thing. It's a very tricky thing because so there's sort of like, um, how can we put it? So what's tricky about it is, is that there are serious consequences to not understanding this. And what I mean by that is, is and this is what's tricky in the world of Buddhism. It's why Maria's question is totally, a, you know, a very good question. So what it is, is, it's about there not being this self that exists in time, right? This is what we've been talking about this evening. The illusion or possibly delusion that there's a self or consciousness that is moving in time and having all kinds of experiences happen to it. This is what we've been talking about. That is a delusional view, but... There isn't a consciousness moving in time. There's sort of this present state of conscious awareness. But this present state of conscious awareness is confused and has a habit of clinging. And there's consequences to that delusional clinging. One way of talking about the consequences of that delusional clinging is rebirth. Or again, like I was saying at the beginning of tonight's talk, if we're not into rebirth, we just need to think about sort of like the vicious cycles of our lives where we keep falling into the same ruts or we keep falling into the same problems. And there's the idea that this keeps happening to me in that way. So that's another, again, another way of thinking about reincarnation is it's just about sort of day after day after day. Forget about lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. It's about this idea of day after day, month after month. Now, the thing about it is, is that there's sort of like this wisdom that the Buddha is conveying, which is that there is this present conscious state of awareness in that way, but it gets confused and clings and there's consequences to that. And those consequences are real in a lived sense. And so... Part of Buddhism talks about the lived experience and what to do about that lived experience. And from a certain context, that lived experience includes your next life. And you might not want to be reborn in a hell realm. But again, if if you don't like the idea or, or, if, or if that sounds wild, the idea of being reborn in a hell realm and fearing the future rebirth in a hell realm, if that sounds kind of weird to you and you're not into that, then just replace it with fearing losing my job and all my money and winding up on the streets destitute. <laughs> that, that's a fine hell realm. And now the teaching is the same, whether you're talking about lifetime after lifetime or just trajectories of one li one's life in that way. Yeah, Maria? Yeah, Maria. 
Yeah, so <laughs> it's funny like that. Um, and so much of path is funny like this. This was sort of the other thread of my thought train after last week. And um, I was reading the treasury of knowledge right. and I just, I, I opened it up to where I was and the, the, it was about provisional teachings versus, um, you know, ultimate teachings. Um, and I was like, oh, because what I wrote down um, was, oh, I, I couldn't figure out why you know, I was asking about karma and you gave me a no self teaching. And then I was like, wait, okay. And then, so it was about basically realizing that, um, that, you know, essentially it boils down to, there's no, there's no beings in the first place, but where I finally got to was, oh, it, it's an upaya and that's related to the provisional teachings. And then I was finally like, oh, it's the entire Buddhist canon, a big upaya. It's kind of like, yeah. So um, that's, that's where I finally got to. And then I just had one other little question I want to sneak in. And that is, it, and that's related to this dependent arising thing. Is a liar consciousness arising dependent on karmic seeds being planted yeah basically okay. and the reason why i'm just answering that and moving on is because it yep. doesn't have anything to do with this sutta the, the alaya yeah. storehouse consciousness idea is a very mahayana idea so but i have something else though maria that i would love to add so i this here's another interesting way to think about um the whole and and maria you brought up the idea of the provisional teaching ultimate teaching which is literally what i just gave everybody i didn't talk about it in that those terms but when i talked about this idea of like the truth is there's no self but there's consequences to not knowing that that's basically doctrine of two truths things but let me give you another example of that so an, an analogy or an example that I give a lot is imagine somebody having a, a anxiety panic attack, a kind of like a paranoid anxiety attack where somebody becomes convinced that people are coming to get them. Like, you it's for one whatever reason somebody comes under the impression that oh, they're going to come get me and from that paranoid delusion there's a sense that they're going to come get me for what i did but i want to make it clear right now you didn't do anything <laughs> but part of the paranoid anxiety attack is thinking i did do something and they're going to come get me for it. So I want you to notice that there's this, I'm setting up an analogy where there, it's not true at all, but there's a lived experience of somebody thinking that they're coming to get me for what I did. But this is where we really want to start noticing it. So now I'm in this kind of panic attack and all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. It's them. They're here now for me. I'm going to go run and hide so that they don't get me. So now I'm like hiding under my bed because I hope they're not going to get me. Notice that later on that evening, <laughs> I'm still convinced they're going to get me. I'm still hiding. So I'm, I'm doing all of these things. I'm performing all of this karma, but it's under the impression that I'm, I'm, they're going to get me. And so when I take steps to avoid being gotten, I'm reinforcing this delusion that they're going to come get me. And this could go on for days and days and days. And yet none of it was ever true. But 
the lived experience of the fear, the anxiety, all of that's real. And that's a very, very Buddhist like thing to recognize. We can talk about emptiness and no self forever, but the suffering's real. And, and I kind of am sharing with you how it is that the suffering is real, even if there isn't a self to be suffering. It's exactly like somebody having a, a panic attack in that way, where it's real because they think it's happening, but it's all, not real, actually. Well, your experience of a self, from a Buddhist point of view, is the exact same way. It's a kind of delusion you're under, but you keep taking actions to perpetuate that delusion. Do I look good in this red hoodie? <laughs> Right? So it's like me asking you, do I look good in this? Is now reinforcing that delusion. And if I keep thinking that way and acting from that place, it's going to keep perpetuating that idea. So that's why the Buddhists are very big about ignorance as the culprit of all of this in that way. Okay. Any other questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Okay, so I'm going to start the next section. I have to tell you it's it's tricky. So the bhikkhu, or sorry, the, the Buddha, after explaining the dependent arising of consciousness in the way that we've just talked about now for quite a bit, the Buddha moves to this kind of a question and answer session with the bhikkhus. And the question is, is this, he says, Hey, everybody, do you see this has come to be? <laughs> and they reply, yes, venerable sir. And the Buddha asks, bhikkhus, do you see its origination occurs with that as a nutriment? And they reply, yes, venerable sir. And the Buddha asks, bhikkhus, do you see with the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation? And the bhikkhus reply, yes, indeed. So let's clarify what all of that means before we attempt to read further. So I'm relying, of course, as usual, on bhikkhu bodhi, bhikkhu bodhi's footnotes, his extensive scholarship in all of this. I kind of trust bhikkhu bodhi kind of implicitly in all of this. So what does this mean? Why? So the Buddha asks everybody, hey, so do you, do you all see now this has come to be? And what he's asking, or what I understand that what he's asking is, so do you bhikkhus see this present state of conscious awareness as what has arisen? In other words, rather than asserting, I am. I exist. Rather than asserting that I am or I exist, the Buddha is asking, do you guys all see that this has come to be? Now, what is the Buddha actually referring to? So he's referring to the aggregation of the five skandhas. So the aggregation of the five or the aggregation of the five aggregates. But what we're talking about, or the way that we put this together, we need to remember that vijnana, the, the topic that we've been talking about all night, consciousness, is the fifth skandha. And I did a lot of talking about the eyeballs, which are form, rupa, matter, material form. Well, that's the first skandha. I also did a lot of talking about contact 
And then this kind of a rising of sensations from that contact. And so that's sensations, the second of the aggregates. So what I'm getting at is, is that the idea of the five aggregates in Buddhism, it's the idea that at this exact moment, you, quote unquote, you, are that aggregation of the five skandhas in that particular form in contact with what was with what is in contact with right now that's what quote you are is this present state of aggregation of oh and it has already changed that aggregation has already changed since i even started this sentence it's it again it changes with every sensory input it's ever morphing in that way it is literally like a shadow to its object where it you your conscious state of awareness is responding perfectly to the environment in that way because it's arising from it and the buddha's asking so do you all bhikkhus do you see that this is what is that this has come to be Again, rather than the idea that I am. And the beakers all say, yes, we see it. We see that this has come to be. And then the Buddha asks bhikkhus, do you see this? Its origin occurs with that as a nutriment. Now, unfortunately, the Buddha doesn't define in this sutra, he doesn't define nutriment until the next section. And so that's a little tricky, but we just need to understand that when the Buddha is talking about kind of nutriment, it's, it's complicated and it's tricky, but you can really just think of it as like that when you're like looking at something, and therefore your eyeballs are in contact with that visual form, and then there's visual awareness arising, well, it's like your eyeballs are kind of like, like eating visual awareness. It's, it's the nutriment of your visual contact or your visual awareness. And so what the Buddha is saying is, so do you see how when there's not that nutriment, they're just isn't that whatever it is? And the bhikkhus reply, yeah, we see it. We see that this or it originates, its origination occurs with that as a nutriment. And that is whatever it is corresponds to. And then he says, all right, bhikkhus, do you see this? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. And that is exactly like when or when I severed the visual contact. I was actually trying to show us that when that is removed as the nutriment, there just isn't the visual awareness anymore. And it's not that the visual awareness has like um, the Buddha, the Buddha often says this, it's not that the visual awareness has receded back into the eyeballs. It's just that it is no longer emergent. It is literally like a magnetic field that when you get the magnets close enough together, whoop, magnetic field, you get them too far apart and whoop, no more magnetic field. And it's not that the magnetic field has like gone somewhere. It's just that the conditions for it to arise are no longer present. So the Buddha is asking the bhikkhu, so do you get it that this is what has arisen and that this arises dependent upon certain conditions? And if you get rid of those conditions, there's just no longer this arising. And they all say, yes, indeed. That's how we see it. All right. That was very, very fast. So any questions about that idea before we kind of go deeper into this section? Makes sense? Okay, so 
the Buddha wants to make sure that the bhikkhus are on point regarding this present state of awareness, not thinking in terms of a subject. And so then the Buddha puts it this way. Bhikkhus, does doubt arise when one is uncertain about this has come to be? And they say, yes. And he says, okay, bhikkhus, does doubt arise when one is uncertain about does its origination occur to that nutriment? And they, they say, yes. And he asks, bhikkhus, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, is what has come to be subject to cessation? And they say, yes. So, the question is, so everything that I just told you about this presently arisen state of awareness that is mistakenly thinking it's a being, that's mistakenly thinking it's me or whatever, right? So we've just spent a nice hour, over an hour talking about this idea, right? And what the Buddha is suggesting here is if you're out there or anybody, and if they hear this and they're like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I think there might be a self that I think I might have been a baby. <laughs> I think it might be me that will see you next week. So the Buddha has said that, that this, <laughs> right, he has said that. This has come to be, but, but if somebody's uncertain about that statement, that's what we're calling doubt. This is what the bhikkhus are agreeing to. That, yeah, that's doubt. If you're uncertain about this has arisen, or if you're uncertain about the idea that if I get rid of that, this will cease to be. That's what the teaching is, but it might be that you're uncertain about that, and that's what constitutes doubt. And same for the third one. It's that idea of this relationship between the nutriment and the arising in that way. And then the Buddha goes through it one, or he actually a few more times, but he goes through it again by saying, okay, bhikkhus, is doubt abandoned? in one who sees it as it actually is with proper wisdom that this has come to be? And they say, yes, venerable sir. That is somebody who has abandoned doubt if they do see that, oh, this has come to be in that way. And same with the, it is abandoning doubt if you come to realize that it is because of that nutriment or that condition that this is arising. And it's the abandonment of doubt if you come to realize that with the removal of that condition, there's just no more this. And then the last time the Buddha says, bhikkhus, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus that this has come to be? And they say, yes. And then he says again, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as a nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. And then bhikkhus, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? That with the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. And they all say, yes, indeed, venerable sir. And the Buddha concludes with this, bhikkhus, purified and bright as this view is that we've been talking about all night, as purified and bright as this view is, if you adhere to it, if you treasure it, if you treat it as a possession, would you then understand that dharma as has been taught as being like a raft 
being for the purpose of crossing over and not for the purpose of grasping? And the bhikkhus all reply, no, venerable sir. Bhikkhus, purified and bright as this view is, if you do not adhere to it, if you don't treasure it or cherish it, if you don't treat it as a possession, would you then understand the Dharma as has been taught as being similar to a raft, as being for the purpose of crossing over and not for the purpose of grasping? And they all reply, yes, indeed, venerable sir. All right, and so of course, for, for me personally, this is why I love Buddhism is because even after this amazing teaching and saying, you know, that this is a really profound idea here, to then say, oh yeah, and by the way, don't get too attached to this idea. It's brilliant. I mean, it's, it's truly um, uh, consistent, if you will, with the teachings in that way. So, um, Questions, comments, answers, ideas. I do have a few final comments, but if there's anything on anybody's mind, I'd love to hear it. Or if there's questions lingering, any insights. Cool. Um, yeah, I think the only thing that I would probably want to say then is a couple of things about we read a sutta, uh, we've read a few suttas, but we've read this sutta or we've read these sutras that are talking about the how the Dharma, the teachings of Buddhism, I, I'm referring particularly to the sutta that we read a few weeks ago on the simile of the snake, in which the Buddha talks about how his teachings about how the Dharma is like a snake in that you have to handle it right. And if you grab it sort of from the wrong place, it'll bite you. But if you grab it the right way, it won't bite you. And in those sutras where the Buddha talks about it, uh, talks about the teachings that way, he's always he always comes back to this idea, which is getting basically attached to the teachings and treating it like a possession. And this could be a possession in a variety of ways, right? But this is a risk. This is sort of a, a danger in that sense. You know, it's what um, uh, Trungpa Rinpoche called, right? Spiritual materialism, right? Where we, we can be very good kind of um, practitioners in not being attached to like worldly things but then we can start to get a little attached or very attached to knowledge or experiences or trips or whatever it is, rather than sort of benefiting from those experiences, we can sort of start carrying them around as badges or as accomplishments in that way. And the Buddha seems to be very aware of that kind of slipperiness where it's kind of very easy to all of a sudden replace your worldly possessions for spiritual possessions in that way. And for me, again, it's why I love Buddhism. There is this very active discourse about not even getting attached to Buddhism, not even getting attached to the Dharma. And that ultimately, that's the practice of the Dharma. And that's, again, for me, kind of totally brilliant <laughs> in that sense. All right. Um, one final point, because I've been doing this lately. And uh, since I have just a, yeah, a few minutes that I'd love to talk about a, something. So Maria, earlier this evening, Maria brought up this kind of more Mahayana idea of the Alaya Vijnana, this kind of idea of a storehouse consciousness. And by the way, 
because I have time, I, I, I will say a little bit more about that idea. So if you've heard of this idea of the storehouse consciousness, it's, it's tricky, but I want to share with you where that idea comes from. So I just got done to the best of my ability. I just got done kind of explaining this idea about how you, <laughs> what you are in that sense is this present state of conscious awareness, right? And what I've been talking about is how basically from a Buddhist point of view, whatever you're not presently in contact with, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't exist. Until you're in contact with it, then it exists. But my point is, is that this type of Buddhism that, that we just went through, that is not only trying to get us into this kind of extreme sense of presence, by which I mean there is only the present moment. And because you are only this state of conscious risen awareness, that's how it is that you are only this present state. Now, the idea from a Buddhist point of view very quickly is that there might be something like anger. Anger would be called a dharma. It's a phenomena. It's kind of a, you know, mental, emotional phenomena, but it's a dharma nonetheless. And the idea is, is that if this conditioned mind comes into contact with something that this conditioned mind finds displeasing in that way, then based upon the contact, there could arise the dharma of anger, and then there would be a present state of being angry, right? What happens is, is that let's say that I have or, and again, I'm trying to be good with my language, but let's say that this mind is conditioned in a way that a certain, I don't know, mm, what could it be? I don't know. Uh, a certain country's flag makes me angry. Now, the idea is, is that let's say I saw that flag but i didn't get angry and then i saw it again and i didn't get angry but then the third time i saw it i got angry and what that means is is that in that third time in that moment of me getting angry the dharma of anger was present and arisen the the really the really intelligent Buddhists, they eventually started asking questions about, but wait, where was that Dharma of anger the first two times when you saw the flag and didn't get angry the first time and didn't get angry the second time? What, like, if the, if the, if your potential for being angry, that dharma of anger, if it was there, like, how could it be there? Because we just got talk done talking tonight about how there is only the present state of conscious awareness. So how could there be basically any continuity of experience? Let me just put it to you simply. That's the question. How could there be any continuity of experience if there's just this present state of arisen awareness. So based upon teachings like these from the kind of the old school Buddhism, the Mahayana started wondering, yeah, where are those latent dharmas that are not manifest, but would be manifest later on? How could they exist if they 
how if there is only the present state of conscious awareness how what's up with these latent dharmas and that's where the fancy mahayana people start talking about a storehouse consciousness and this is it gets really tricky it's really really tricky because even the buddha in the sutras where he talks about the alaya consciousness he even says oh yeah and i didn't tell you about this before because i knew you'd think it was a self i kn i knew that you guys would cling to it as a new self and that's why i didn't tell you about it earlier <laughs> Or that you would cling to it as the true self or cling to it as some higher self. But we will spend a Dharma doors sometime talking about the Alaya Vijnana. But just because I had time, I did want to share with you that the teachings of the older form of Buddhism, they, they leave a few uh, aporia would be a good word for it. Uh, aporia, uh, they leave some the old teachings leave a few unanswered questions in that way. L like the question of latent non-manifest dharmas and like, where are they? And so then the Mahayana develops these more complicated ideas. Speaking of complicated ideas of consciousness, I just, before I go, I just want to let everybody know that um, in my little school of Buddhism, I'm going to be teaching a 10-week course on a sutra, a Mahayana sutra called the Shurangama Sutra or the Shurangama Sutra. So it's a 10-week course on Thursday nights from 6 to 7.30. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is because that sutra, the Shurangama Sutra, it's entirely a sutra about the nature of the mind and consciousness. It gets into the storehouse consciousness. It gets into everything we've talked about tonight. So if you would be interested, awesome. So yeah, if you'd be interested in kind of exploring the Mahayana ideas of consciousness and mind and all of that, then I would strongly recommend reading the Sharangama Sutra. And I would, of course, recommend taking my course. So, all right, but that's it. And if you're interested in that, I think uh, I think a link was put in the chat, or you can go to my website, lotusunderground.com, and find out more about the course. Otherwise, I'll be back here next Sunday night, and we will keep going with this sutra, and we're going to talk more about nutriment. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate it so much, as always. Love seeing everybody. Love being here with you.